This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Betsy Bush. Marquette, Michigan, July 2006. Warlord of Core by Terry Carr. Chapter 3. Ryanson continued to smile at her for several seconds, until her words penetrated. Then he abruptly sat up and steadied himself with one hand against the edge of the table. "'Can you get one for me?' She gave a reluctant shrug. "'If you insist, and if Manning okays it. But is it a good idea, direct contact with a mind so alien?' As a matter of fact, now that he was faced with the actual possibility of it, he wasn't so sure. But he said, "'We'll only know once we've tried it.' Mara dropped her eyes and swirled her drink, watching the tiny red spots form inside the glass and rise to the surface. There was a brief silence between them. "'Repent, Leroy Anson!' The words burst upon his ears over the waves of sound that filled the room. He turned, half-rising, to find René Malholm hovering over him, his wide grin showing a tooth missing in the bottom row. Ryanson settled back into his chair. "'Don't shout. I'm going to have a headache soon enough.' Malholm took the chair which Manning had vacated, and sat in it heavily. He set his hand-lettered placard against the edge of the table, and leaned forward, waving a thick finger. "'You consort with men who would enslave the pure in heart,' he rumbled. But Ryanson didn't miss the laughter in his eye. "'Manning,' he nodded, "'he'd enslave every pure heart on this planet, if he could find one. As a matter of fact, I think he's already working on Mara here.' Malholm turned to her and sat back, appraising her boldly. Mara met his gaze calmly— raising her eyebrows slightly as she waited for his verdict. Malholm shook his head. "'If she's pure, then it's a sin,' he said. "'A thrice-damned sin, Lee. Have I ever expostulated to you upon the Janus coin that is good and evil?' "'Often,' Ryanson said. Malholm shrugged and turned again to the girl. "'Nevertheless,' he said, "'I greet you with pleasure.' "'Mara, this is René Malholm,' Ryanson said wearily. "'He imagines that we're friends, and I'm afraid he's right.' Malholm dipped his shaggy head. "'The name is from the old French of Earth. Bad man. I have a long and dishonorable family history, but the earliest of my ancestors, whom I've been able to trace, had the same name. Apparently there were too many smiths, carpenters, bakers, and priests on that world.' The time was ripe for a male home. My first name would have been pronounced René, before the language reform dropped all accent marks from earth tongues. Considering your background, Mara smiled, you're in good company out here. Good company? Malholm cried. I'm not looking for good company. My work, my mission, calls me to where men's hearts are the blackest, where repentance and redemption are needed. "'And so I come to the edge.' "'You're religious?' she asked. "'Who is religious in these days?' Malholm asked, shrugging. "'Religion is of the past. It is dead. It is nearly forgotten. And one hears God's name spoken now in anger. "'God damn you!' cry the masses. "'That is our modern religion.' "'Rene wanders around shouting about sin,' Ryanson explained so that he can take up collections to buy himself more to drink. Malholm chuckled. Ah, Lee, you're short-sighted. I'm an unbeliever and a black rogue, but at least I have a mission. Our scientific advance has destroyed religion. We've penetrated to the heavens and found no God. But science has not disproved him either, and people forget that. I speak with the voice of the forgotten. I remind people of God to even the scales. He stopped talking long enough to grab the arm of a passing waiter and order a drink. Then he turned back to them. Nothing says I have to believe in religion. If that were necessary, no one would preach it. Have you been preaching to the Herlogy? Ryanson asked. An admirable idea, Malholm said. Do they have souls? 
They have a god, at least, or used to, anyway. Fellow named Kor, who was god, essence, knowledge, and several other things all rolled into one. "'Return to Kor, Malholm said. "'Perhaps it will be my next mission.' "'What's your mission now?' Mara asked, smiling in spite of herself. "'Besides your apparently lifelong study and participation in sin, I mean.' Malholm sighed and sat back as his drink arrived. He dug into the pouch strung from his waist and flipped a coin to the waiter. "'Believe it or not, I have one,' he said, and his voice was now low and serious. "'I'm not just a lounger, a drifter.' "'What are you?' "'I am a spy,' he said, and raised his glass to drain half of it with one swallow. Mara smiled again, but he didn't return it. He sat forward and turned to Ryanson. "'Manning has been busily wrapping up the appointment for the governorship here,' he said. "'You probably know that.' Ryanson nodded. The headache he had been expecting was already started. "'Did you also know that he's been buying men here to stand with him in case someone else is appointed?' he glanced at Mara. "'I go among the men every day, talking, and I hear a lot. Manning will end up in control here, one way or another, unless he's stopped.' "'Buying men is nothing new,' Ryanson said. "'In any case, is there a better man on the planet?' Malholm shook his head. "'I don't know. Sometimes I give up on the human race. Manning, at least, has a little culture in him. But he's more vicious than he seems, nevertheless. If he gets control here—' "'It will be no worse than any of the other planets out here,' Ryanson concluded for him. "'Except for one thing, perhaps. The Hurlogy. I don't have much against men killing each other. That's their own business. But unless we get somebody better than Manning governing here, the Hurlogy will be wiped out. The men here are already talking. They're afraid of them. Why? The Hurlogy are harmless. Because of their size, and because we don't know anything about them. Because they're intelligent. Any uneducated man is afraid of intelligence. And when it's an alien— He shook his head. "'Manning isn't helping the situation.' "'What do you mean by that?' Mara asked. Malholm's frown deepened, creasing the dark lines of his forehead into furrows. "'He's using the Hurlogy as boogeymen. Says he's the only man on the planet who knows how to deal with them safely. Oh, you should hear him when he moves among his people. I envy his ability to control them with words. A little back-slapping, a joke or two. Most of them I was telling last year, and he talks to them man to man, very friendly. He shook his head again. Manning is so friendly with this scum that his attitude is nothing short of patronizing. Ryanson smiled wearily at Malholm. For all the man's wildness, he couldn't help liking him. It had been like this every time he had run into him on a dozen of the edge worlds. Malholm, dirty and cynical, moved among the dregs of the stars preaching religion and fighting the corporations, the opportunists, the phony rebels who wanted nothing for anyone but themselves. He had been known to break heads together with his huge fists, and he had no qualms about stealing or even killing when his anger was aroused. Yet there was a peculiar honesty about him. "'You always have to have a cause, don't you, Rene?' The grain giant shrugged. It makes life interesting, and it makes me feel good sometimes. But I don't overestimate myself. I'm scum, like the rest of them. The only difference is that I know it. I'm just a man, with no more rights than anyone else, except those I can take. He held up his large knuckled hands and turned them in front of his face. I've got broken bones in both of them. I wonder if the Buddha or the Christ ever hit a man. The books on religion that are left in the repositories don't say. Would it make any difference if they hadn't? Ryanson asked. Hell no! I'm just curious. Malholm stood up, hefting his repentance sign in the crook of one big arm. His face again took on its arched look as he said, My duty calls me elsewhere, but I leave you with a message from the scriptures, and it has been my guiding light. Resist not evil, my children. Resist not evil. Who said that? Ryanson asked. Malholm shook his head. Damned if I know, he muttered, and went away. 
After a moment, Ryanson turned back to the girl. She was still watching Malholm thread his way through the men on his way to the door. "'So now you've met my spiritual father,' he said. Her deep brown eyes flickered back to his. "'I wish I could use a telepather on him. I'd like to know how he really thinks.' "'He thinks exactly as he speaks,' Ryanson said. "'At least at the moment he says something, he believes in it.' She smiled. "'I suppose that's the only possible explanation for him.' She was silent for a moment, her face thoughtful. Then she said, "'He didn't finish his drink.' "'You're all hooked up,' the girl said. "'Nod or something when you're ready.' She was bent over the telepather, double-checking the connectives and the blinking meters. Ryanson and Harong sat opposite each other, the huge dark mound of the alien looming silently over the earthmen. He never seemed upset, Ryanson thought, looking up at him, except for that one time when they'd run into the stone wall of the block on Tebron. Harong had displayed a completely even temperament, unruffled, calm, almost disinterested. But, of course, if the aliens had been completely uninterested in the Earthmen's probings at their history, they would never have cooperated so readily. The Herlogy were not animals to be ordered about by the Earthmen. Probably the codification of their history would prove useful to the aliens, too. They had never arranged the race memory into a very coherent order themselves. Not that that was surprising, Ryanson decided. The Herlogy had no written language. Their telepathic abilities had made that unnecessary, and organization of material into neatly outlined form was a characteristic as much of the earth languages as of Terran mentality. Such organization was not a herlogy trait, apparently, at least not now in the twilight of their civilization. The huge aliens lived dimly through these centuries, dreaming in their own way of the past, and their way was not the earthmen's. So, if they cooperated with the survey team on codifying and recording their history, who was the servant? Well, with a direct linkage of minds, the work would go faster. Ryanson looked up at Mara and nodded, and she flicked the connection on the telepather. Suddenly, like being overwhelmed by a breaking wave of seawater, Ryanson felt Harong's mind envelop him. A torrent of thoughts, memories, pictures, and concepts poured over him in a jumble— the sensory sensations of the alien came to him sharply, and memories that were strange, ideas that were incomprehensible, all in a sudden rush upon his mind. He fought down the fear that had leapt in him, gritted his teeth, and waited for the wave to subside. It did not subside. It settled. As the two minds, Earthmen and Herlogy, met in direct linkage, they became almost one— Gradually, Ryanson could begin to see some pattern to the impressions of the alien. The picture of himself came first. He was small and angular, sitting several feet below Harong's, or his own, eyes. But more than that, he was not merely light, but pallid, not merely small, but fragile. The alien's view of reality, even through his direct sensations, was not merely visual or tactile, but interpreted automatically in his own terms. The odor of the hall in which they sat was different, the very temperature warmer. Ryanson could see himself reeling on the stone bench where he sat, and Mara, strangely distorted, put out a hand to steady him. At the same time he was seeing through his own eyes— feeling her hand on his shoulder. But the alien sensations were stronger. Their very strangeness commanded the attention of his mind. He righted himself, physically and mentally, and began to probe tentatively in this new part of his mind. He could feel Harong, too, reaching slowly for contact. His presence was comfortable, mild, confused, but unworried. As his thoughts blended with Harong's, the present faded perceptibly. This confusion was merely a moment in centuries, and soon, too, it would pass. Ryanson could feel himself relaxing. Now he could reach out and touch the strange areas of this mind, the concepts and attitudes of an alien race and culture and experience. Everything became dim and dreamlike. The Earthmen possibly didn't exist. The dry wastes of Hurlage had always been here, or perhaps they had once been green— but through four generations the large hall had stood thus, 
and the animals changed by the day too fast to distinguish them, even under core if he should be reached. Why? There was no reason. There was no purpose, no goal, no necessity, no wishing, questing, hoping, no curiosity. All would pass. All was passing even now. Perhaps already it was gone. Ryanson shifted where he sat, reaching for the feeling of the stone bench beneath him for equilibrium, pulling out of Harang's thoughts and going back in almost immediately. A chaos of mind enveloped him, but he was beginning to familiarize himself with it now. He probed slowly for the memories, down through Harang's own personal memories of three centuries, dry feet on the dust and low winds, down to the racial pool, and he found it. Even knowing the outlines of the race's history did not help Ryanson to place and correlate these impressions, which came to him one on top of another, overlapping, merging, blending. He saw buildings which towered over him, masses of his people moving quietly around him, and thoughts came to him from their minds. He was Norhib, artisan, working slowly day by— He was Roshana, approaching the gate of the wall and looking— he was Lorheen, discussing the site where— He was digging the ground, pushing the heavy cart, lying on the pelt of animals, demolishing the buildings which would soon fall, instructing a child in balance. A dirt-caked street stretched before him by night, the stones individually cut and smooth with the passage of heavy feet. "'Tomorrow we will set out for the region of chalk while there is still time.' A mind-voice from a herlogy hundreds, perhaps thousands of years old, dead but alive in the race memory. Ryanson could feel the whole personality there, in the memories, but he passed on. Murba has said that the priests will take him. There is no need for planting this year. The soil is dry. There is no purpose. The child's mind is ready for war. He felt Harong himself watching him, beside him, or behind him, nearby, anyway. The alien heard and saw with him, and stayed with him like a protector. Ryanson felt his presence warmly. The calm of the alien continued to relax him. Old leather mother hen, he thought, and Harong beside him seemed almost amused. Suddenly he was Tebron, Tebron Marl, prince in the region of mines, young and strong and ambitious. Ryanson caught and held those impressions. He felt the muscles ripple strangely through his body as Tebron stretched, felt the cold wind of the flat cut through his loose garment. It was night, and he stood on the parapet of a heavy stone structure looking down across the immense stretch of the flat, spotted here and there by lights. He controlled all this land, and would control more. He was Tebron again, marching across the flat at the head of an army. Metal weapons hung at the sides of his men, crudely fashioned bludgeons and jagged-edged swords, all quickly forged in the workshops of the region of mines. The babble of mind voices swelled around him, fear and anger and boredom, dull resentment, and other emotions Ryanson could not identify. They were marching on the city of the temple. He slipped sideways in Tebron's mind, and suddenly he was in the middle of the battle. There was dust all around, kicked up by the scuffling feet of the huge warriors, and his breath came in gasps. Mind voices shouted and screamed, but he paid no attention. He swung his bludgeon over his head with a ferocity that made it whistle with a low sound in the wind. One of the defenders broke through the line around him, and he brought the bludgeon smashing down at him before he could thrust with his sword. The warrior fell to one side at the last moment, and took the blow along one arm. He could feel the pain in his own mind, but he ignored it. Before the warrior could bring up his sword again, Tebron crushed his head with the bludgeon, and the scream of pain in his own head disappeared. He heard the grunting and gasps of his own warriors, and the clash of bodies and weapons around him. The herlogy could not really be moving so quickly, Ryanson thought. It must be that to Tebron it seemed so. They were quiet, slow-moving creatures. 
or had they degenerated physically through the centuries? Still smelling the sweat of battle, he found Tebron's mind again. There was still fighting in the city, but it was far away now. He heard it with the back of his mind as he mounted the steps of the temple. Those were mop-up operations, clearing the streets of the last of the priest-king forces. He was not needed there. He had, to all intents, controlled the city since the night before, and had slept in the palace itself. Now it was time for the temple. He mounted the heavy, steep steps slowly, three guards at his back and three in front of him. The priest would be gone from the temple, but there might be one or two last-ditch defenders remaining, and they would be armed with the weapons of Kor. Hand weapons, which shot dark beams that would disintegrate anything in their path. They would be dangerous. Well, there would be no temple guards in the inner court. His own men could remain outside to take care of them while he went in. He stopped halfway up the steps and lifted his head to gaze up at the temple walls rising above him. They were solid stone, built in the fashion of the old ones, smooth-faced except for the carvings above the entrance itself. They too were in the traditional style, copied exactly from the older buildings which had been built thousands of years ago, before the herlogy had even developed telepathy, the symbols of Kor. So now at last he saw them. Tomorrow he would effect a mass linkage of mines and broadcast his orders for reconstruction. That would mean staying up all night preparing the communication, for it was impossible to maintain complete planet-wide linkage for too long, and Tebron had many plans. Perhaps it would be possible to find a way to extend the duration of mass linkages if the science quest could be pushed forward fast enough. But that was tomorrow's problem. Today, right now, it was right that he entered the temple. It was not only symbolic of his assumption of power, but necessary religiously. Every new ruler leader within the memory of the race had received sanction from Kor first. A momentary echo whisper of another mind touched his, and he whirled to his right to see one of the temple guards in the shadows. He had been unable to successfully shield his thoughts. Tebron jaw to the ground and sent a quick, cool order to his own guards. "'Kill him!' The heavy, dark warriors stepped forward as the guard tried to shrink back further into the shadows. He was trapped, but not unarmed. As he dropped to the steps and rolled quickly to one side, Tebron heard the low vibration of a disintegrator beam pass over his shoulder and the crack of the wall behind him as it struck. And then the guards were on the warrior in the shadows." They had brought down several of the temple guards the night before, and commandeered their weapons. In a matter of moments, this one fell too, his head and most of his trunk gone. One of the warriors shoved the half-carcass down the stairs, and bent forward at the knees to pick up this fallen weapon. So now they had all fourteen of them. If any more of the temple guards remained, they could be dealt with easily. Tebron rose from the steps and wished momentarily that those weapons could be duplicated. If his whole army could be equipped with them. But after today, that would probably be unnecessary. The entire planet was his now. He walked up the last few steps and stepped into the shadows of the Temple of Kor. The walls melted around him, and Ryanson felt his mind wrenched painfully. There was a screaming all through him, thin and high, blotting out the contact he had held with Tebron's mind. It was Harong's scream beside him, overpowering. Tebron washed over him. He tried to fight it, but he couldn't. The shadows of the walls twisted and faded. Tebron's thoughts disappeared, and all that remained was the screaming and the fear, like a mouth open wide against his ear and hot breath shouting into him. He felt his stomach turn and nausea and vertigo threw him panting out of Tebron's mind. Yet Harang was still beside him in the darkness, and as the echoes faded he felt him there, alien, but calm. There had been fear in this huge alien mind, but it had disappeared almost immediately with the breaking of the connection with Tebron. All that remained in Harong's mind now was a dull quietness. Ryanson felt a rueful grin on his face, and he said, perhaps aloud and perhaps not, "'You haven't forgotten what happened there, old leather. The memories are there all right.' From Harong's mind came a slow rebuilding of the fear that he had just experienced. 
but it subsided. And as it did, Ryanson probed again into his mind, searching quickly for that contact he had just lost. He could almost feel Tebron's mind, began to see the darkness forming, the wall shadows. Then again there was a blast of the terror, and he felt his mind reeling back from those memories. The screaming filled his mind and body, and this time he felt Harong himself blocking him, pushing him back. But there was no need for that. The fear was not Harong's alone. Ryanson felt it, too, and he retreated before its onslaught, with an overpowering need to preserve his own sanity. When the darkness subsided, Ryanson became aware of himself still sitting on the stone bench, sweat drenching his body. Harong sat before him in the same position he had been in when they had started. It was as if nothing had happened at all. Ryanson wearily raised one hand, and motioned to Mara to break the linkage. She switched off the telepather, and gingerly removed the wires from his head, frowning worriedly at him. But she waited for him to speak. He grinned at her after a moment, and said, "'It was a bit rough in there. We couldn't break through.' She was removing the wires from Harong, who sat unmoving, staring dully over Ryanson's shoulder at the wall behind him. "'You should have seen yourself when you were under,' she said. "'I wanted to break the connection before, but I wasn't sure.' Ryanson sat forward and flexed the muscles of his shoulders and back. They ached as though they had been tense for an hour, and his stomach was still knotted tight. "'There's a real block there,' he said. It's like a thousand screaming birds flapping in your face. When you get that far into his mind, you feel it, too. He sat staring down at his feet, exhausted mentally and physically. She sat on the bench and looked closely at him. Anything else? Yes, harang. At the end, the second time I went in, I could feel him, not only fighting me, but hating me. He looked up at her. Can you imagine actually feeling him right next to you, in your mind, like you were one person, hating you? Across from them, the huge figure of the alien slowly stood up and looked at them for several long seconds, then turned and left the building. End of chapter 3